In the heart of the state of Tennessee, hidden from sight off a busy highway, is a prison that's home to one of the world's most notorious murderers, Krista Pike. Krista Pike, I think she's not a human being. She's manipulative. She knows how to sort of be charming and sympathetic and be somebody that you sort of could be wooed by. She's kind of almost like a chameleon. Very sneaky, very sly. This gal, I see nothing good as a human being about her. She's pure evil. Krista Pike committed a brutal killing. Her crime was particularly violent. Her victim suffered for a very long time. Krista kept a piece of her skull and put it in her black leather jacket. That was her souvenir. Pike was a Satanist and believed her victim to be a sacrifice. Her forehead was cut several paces, her throat was cut, and she had a, a massive circle with a star upside down star called pentagram. Pike was one of the youngest women ever to be sent to death row in the US. She killed, tried to kill another girl in prison. She's gotten two guards fired. What do you think when you think about the electric chair? Um, I don't really think about that because I don't think I'm ever going to see it. She is exactly where she belongs. Don't wait another 20 years. Put this girl to death right now. K. Johnson Rehabilitation Center has held Krista Pike on death row since 1996. Here was this kind of cute, innocent looking girl with long sort of reddish hair off and up, little petite, and you would look at her and think, that's the person who did this? Now, when talking to Krista, she sounded just like a 10, 11, 12-year-old little girl. If you turn turns your back on her, you would think she's just a kid, little kid. I would compare her to Hannibal Lecter in the sense that here's a charming, intelligent person that you think, oh, I like their company. They're thoughtful and well-spoken, and that might be the most dangerous kind because before you realize it, it's too late and you may be in great danger. I didn't realize that that little whimsical fun ball of fire that I, I was calling my best friend could do that something so evil and so heinous that you, there's no coming back from that. This wasn't just an attack with them slicing her back, cutting her neck, which they did, or stabbing her so many times that the medical examiner lost count. Krista Pike was sent to death row at the age of 18. But even with the toughest sentence possible hanging over her, she refused to behave. There was two guards that she was having sex with in the prison and they caught one, and the other one was, he was fixing to help her escape off of death row. She's very dangerous. I think Krista Pike would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, she likes blood, she likes crime, she likes cutting. Krista Pike grew up in North Carolina, a state of rolling hills and huge expanses of countryside. But her childhood was far from idyllic. I knew she had an extremely rough childhood, uh, tough growing up, parent being bounced from parent to parent to grandparent. It was hard. Her mom was never, never really there, never present. I mean, she was there long enough to be angry and 
and to yell at her. A lot of the time there was alcohol in the house, but there was no food. As she grew up, sexual abuse became a prominent feature in her life. She was molested by her mother's boyfriends. Her and her mother smoked pot together when she was very young. And she just had a terrible childhood. Her mother had multiple husbands and multiple men, some of whom were abusive. It's, it was extreme for her. It's not just that the sexual abuse occurred to her, it's that the sexual abuse occurred to her and then there was no type of support, no type of care, no type of treatment for her to address that trauma. And so that probably had a very long-standing negative effect on Krista's, Krista Pike's psychological development and the way she viewed herself as well as the world. At the age of 18, Pike dropped out of school and moved to Knoxville, Tennessee. The original capital of Tennessee, Knoxville, lies in the east of the state at the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. Knoxville always has got this kind of strange news vein, if you will. There's always something kind of odd going on. It's a smaller town. It's not a big town like Atlanta or Nashville. Knoxville was growing in the 1990s. It was growing fast. And uh, so things was changing. There was colleges everywhere. There was little outside cafes. And everybody was out walking, you know, and talking and meeting people and eating dinner. And it was just fun. Krista Pike joined a nursing course at the government-run Job Corps program, which had a base in Knoxville. The actual Knoxville Job Corps Center at Dell Avenue used to be an old hotel, a Holiday Inn. My mama actually worked there as a maid. And there's about five floors. My name is Joe Mode. I worked at the Knoxville Job Corps from 1992 up till April 19th, 95. Joe taught many subjects at Job Corps, including cultural awareness, reading, and parenting skills. You know, it was designed for kids that, uh, you know, maybe had a difficult home life, uh, maybe had problems in, in school. And, you know, typically kids maybe from 15 up to 20, 22 years of age to get a second chance and to learn a job skill like nursing you know, business clerical, building trades. I think the Knoxville Job Corps had maybe about 350 students at the time, you know, that I was working there. Although the program started off well, it soon began to attract a different type of student. Somewhere along the line, the thoughts were to put troubled kids in the Job Corps Center. Uh, if they commit a criminal act, but rather than go to prison, let them join the Job Corps. A lot of the very good students often were harassed or beat up, um, you know, jumped, you know, and uh, they left. And things like that often happened. And we lost some, you know, very bright students, you know, that were really wanted to try. Krista Pike became part of this troubled environment but she quickly found a good friend in Kim Elualu. We had a lot of the same classes, and Krista's room was probably five doors down. So I was sitting outside, and she walked over, and she said, can I sit here? I said, yep, and that was the end of it. We were kind of inseparable at that point. Krista was very much my best friend. The two friends hung out together, riding the free trolley bus around Knoxville. From four until 10 o'clock, it was free time. So we would all just sign ourselves out and head up to the strip. And that's where we stayed for hours. You know, hardly anybody had any money. We just hung out with each other. It was a lot of fun. It was actually a lot of fun. Kim and Krista became so close they came to depend on one another. 
she was always laughing and um, she would go out of her way to do things special just to make you feel better or to make you, um, when I was sick, she went all the way up that huge hill and just, she went and got me candy and um, she's like, just so you feel better, love you. She was a ball of, a ball of life. Little did Kim know that her fun-loving best friend would commit one of the most horrific murders Knoxville had ever witnessed. Another student at Job Corps was 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer. My impression of Colleen is that here is a woman who was trying to do the best that she could, who had had some rough times as a girl. Uh, her parents were split. Colleen was very sweet. She'd often come to my class and, and we'd talk about life and things going on just in general. Colleen was just a very sweet, quiet, mild-mannered, you know, young lady. You know, she's just sweet. Colleen Slimmer was born and raised in Florida and had come to Knoxville Job Corps to do a six-month course in computing. My name is May Martinez, the mother of Colleen Ann Slimmer. Colleen was a kid that loved to play outside, roller skating. She'd do a lot of Special Olympics, stuff like that, and helping others all the time. Florida didn't have a Job Corps government program for her that she wanted, it the closest was, was Tennessee. She had a mom who loved her dearly. She had sisters who loved her. Um, yeah, I think there was hope that she was gonna come out of this, uh, having learned some skills and get on the road to a profession. For Colleen, moving states was an exciting opportunity. My husband and her and me all talked and we did not want her to go because too far from home, I wanted her with me. Colleen's always been an independent person. She always was a go-getter. So she's a, she felt good being on her own. She said, look, Mom, I actually got out. I'm not living at home. <laughs> so it was nice, yeah. Colleen was 18 when she went. She left October 31st in 94. The day she left for Job Corps, that's the last time we had even seen each other. Knoxville, Tennessee, Krista Pike was enrolled on a nursing course at the Job Corps Center. 19-year-old Colleen Slemmer was also studying there, but was not having the greatest time. Colleen said there was a couple kids bothering her, and they were going in her room, taking her jewelry, taking her clothes, and stuff like that. She mentioned two girls and a guy. She didn't mention their names. She said there were just three kids that's bothering her. These three kids were Krista Pike, her new boyfriend, Tadero Ship, and their friend, Shadola Peterson. All of them were studying at Job Corps. Pike's best friend, Kim, had introduced Tadero to Krista. I had already known Tadero for a while. So when he got there, he was like, who is that? And I was like, her name's Krista. And I left them sitting out there, and that was the end of that <laughs> because they were inseparable after that. Pike began a relationship with Tadero, but she also developed a vendetta against her boyfriend's previous crush, Colleen. I think at one point, Tadero liked um, Colleen, but then like when Krista got there, his attention went straight to Krista and he forgot everybody else, like anybody else, he, he just didn't care. I understood that there was a love triangle, you know, that maybe Colleen and Tadero had dated and then Pike and uh, Tadero and Krista Pike was jealous. 
Krista was extremely possessive of Tadaro, extremely. I didn't realize that that obsession was festering in Krista's head that Colleen was after Tadaro. Krista saw her as a threat, and it was a threat that was so big in her mind that ultimately she decided, I have to take her out. Kim noticed Krista's hatred of Colleen had taken a violent turn. So it was Saturday afternoon. There was probably 12, 13 of us just kind of hanging out, just chatting about people they liked, people they didn't like. Colleen's name came up, and Krista said, oh my god, I'm going to kill her. And I said, but you leave that girl alone. She didn't do anything to you. And she, she smiled at me, she winked, and next subject. And that was all. On January 12th, 1995, Krista Pike turned her words into actions. Pike, Ship, and their friend Shadola Peterson decided to lure Colleen away from the Job Corps Center. I was in my room, Krista come in, and she says, well, we're getting ready to go to the park. And I was like, who's going to the park? Me, Shadala, and Tadaro, and Colleen. I'm like, why? We're going to go smoke in the park. She winked at me. She smiled at me. And she left. And I watched them all from my balcony. I watched them all sign out, and them all, all four of them leave together. And I probably should have known or should have said, hey, please don't go, or to somebody, because it was just like, it was a like impending doom kind of feeling in my stomach. At 8.50 p.m., with the promise of smoking weed, Colleen was taken through the streets of Knoxville to Tyson Park. And they would have walked down Cumberland Avenue toward Tyson Park, which is where we are right now, and they would have cut through right through here under the bridge. You'll notice, as we keep walking, you begin to feel like you're in a more remote location, that you're sort of leaving the city behind. And it was perfect, because they're getting further removed where nobody can hear them. Krista Pike had come armed. Krista Pike took with her a meat cleaver and a box cutter. So it sounds like there was already some premeditation into what was going to happen in these woods. And it would have been about this point where Colleen is like, I'm in trouble, something's not right. They walked to the edge of the park and onto the boundary of the University of Tennessee. They get to this point having walked, and now Colleen, Krista, and Tadaro, and we don't know, perhaps Shadala are now turning on Colleen, and Krista begins to accuse Colleen of having aims on her boyfriend, Tadaro. The argument quickly turned violent. They stabbed her. They beat her. They chased her down. Uh, they tortured her, essentially. They tormented her. They talked to her after she begged, let me go. They wouldn't let her go. Krista stabbed her over 300 times. This was slow torture of a girl who was begging for her life and trying to leave, and that did not seem to affect Krista Pike. She fought for 45 minutes of her life. Every time she would run, they would punch her and cut her and grab her, and when they did that, they knocked her back down again. They took her clothes off of her, her top and her jacket so she couldn't run anymore. And then Krista held her down why to Daryl carved a pentagram in her chest while she was alive. They told me that it was part of a satanic ritual. The victim told her that uh, 
So if you'll let me go, I'll, I'll, I'll hitchhike out here and go home tonight. And Krista said, you know it's too late for that. You do know who's killing you. The violence was relentless. Krista picked up a piece of asphalt and started smashing it against her skull because in Krista's words, Krista's words, the wouldn't die. Krista kept banging the rock in her head and said, you know who's doing this to you? And call me with girdle blood and say yes. And she kept doing it until Colin couldn't talk anymore. Krista reaches down into this bloody mess and plucks out a piece of her victim's skull as a souvenir. After the murder, Pike, Ship, and Peterson returned to the Job Corps Center and signed back in. She busted my door, and that's when she unfolded this horrendous story. And I, I just stood there, just totally in shock. She's like, the would die. And I was like, oh. oh. What do you mean? She's like, I cut her throat nine times. Uh, she's like, I stabbed her in the back. It sickened me and shocked me, but at the same time, it was just like, this is not, uh, I don't even know what to say. Pike then proudly showed Kim her murder trophy, the fragment of Colleen's skull. She showed me the piece, and um, she said they had stopped at the at some gas station to try to clean some of the blood off. And then she looked at me, and she said, but if you tell anybody, I'll kill you too. Smiled and winked at me, told me she loved me, and she'd see me in the morning. I tried to go to sleep, but it, it was like a horror movie kept playing in my head. And it's like every time I closed my eyes, I seen that, I seen Colleen's face just like coming at me. I was a naive 16 year old kid. I had no idea what to do or how to handle it. Is what's interesting about Krista Pike is that she reportedly bragged about having committed this crime to peers. That points to this level of huge ego and grandiosity that is seen often in psychopaths. Colleen's body was discovered the next morning, January 13th. Body was found sort of in a heap, partially displayed, partially covered. Uh, the testimony was hardly recognizable as a human being. When they announced that the body had been found and what she was wearing, I told my wife, I said, oddly enough, I think that might be a girl I know at Job Corps, and sure enough, it was. Colleen's mom, May Martinez, had spent the previous night trying to contact her daughter. I couldn't get a hold of Colleen. I kept trying, and they kept saying she wasn't in her room, and she's still out, and she didn't check back in again. And then I kept, the next morning, I kept calling and I had to take my youngest daughter to the doctors. So when I got home, there was a phone call on my recording saying, please contact Detective York Homicide. Well, I was extremely upset because I kept saying it wasn't true. Um, I said, no, that's not Colleen. I beat myself up still, because I seen them all leaving. I could have said to somebody, you know, hey, they're going to beat her up or something. But I didn't really think it would go that far. I honestly didn't. Eighteen-year-old Krista Pike, along with her 17-year-old boyfriend, Tadero Ship, and friend Shadola Peterson, had just tortured and brutally murdered teenager Colleen Slemmer. Once her body was found, it was only a matter of time 
before the trail led back to Krista Pike. I got the first call about the body around 7, 7.30. My name's Randy York, and I was the criminal investigator assigned to the Job Corps murder. I went to the scene and viewed the body and the evidence. She was clad only in blue jeans. She had nothing up top, and she had a, a massive circle with a star, upside down star called pentagram in it. Her forehead was cut several paces. Her throat was cut. If you don't know what pentagram is, the upside down star in a circle, and it represents the goat head of Satan. It was an open secret at Job Corps that there was a small group of students who practiced Satanism. Two of those were Krista Pike and her boyfriend, Tadaro. I had her in class, um, you know, and you know some students better than others, but as far as her reputation and to Darrell's, you know, we knew that, um, you know, that they were into, you know, satanic worship. In Knoxville and Tennessee is the Bible Belt. You'll find a church on every corner. So, you know, if there are people that do that, you know, they're you know, an oddity. You know, we, it wasn't something common at all. Randy talked to the security officer at the center to see which students had left the building that night. I looked at the sign out sheet and I saw four people had signed out. Colleen Slimmer, Shadala Peterson, Krista Pike, and Tadaro Ship. Tadaro, Krista Pike, and Shadala Peterson signed back in. There was no signature of Colleen Slimmer. I put an officer on each of the rooms, and I started from one room to the next room, uh, went in and interviewed them, and I found uh, through, uh, found a satanic altar and a Bible in, in Tadaro's room, a lot of satanic literature. I found uh, some in Crystal Pike's room. The more we learned about them, the more we realized they were deep into Satanism. They had uh, tattoos. She had the little devil tattoo on her, on her uh, left chest. Randy now had his suspects with Pike, the ringleader. The police informed Colleen's mother of their findings so far. All they could tell me is they had the three kids in, in custody who killed Colleen, and they were pretty sure it was Colleen. Asked me to get her dental records sent to them so they can make a positive identification. While in custody, Krista Pike confessed to Colleen's murder. She actually played the part of the victim's role and her role, what she did and how the victim reacted. And she would actually get down and sh show me how the victim would beg for her life. I would describe uh, Krista as giddy. And what I mean by that is she was happy, almost to the point she, it was silly acting, that she was so happy that what she had done is something great. She didn't try to hold anything back. The fact that she bragged about this, didn't seem to display any remorse or any empathy, tells me that she likely enjoyed engaging in this torture of this poor young girl. That's not something you see often. On January 15th, 1995, Randy charged Krista Pike to Daryl Ship and Shadola Peterson with the murder of Colleen Slemmer. We're now in the city county building, which is the center of government here in Knoxville and Knox County. And this is the courtroom where Krista was tried for murder. When Krista arrived at the court, her manner was unsettling. She would stick out to me as one of the few that I think probably enjoyed the attention. Uh, she would look around the courtroom to see who else was there. One time I can remember her as she was entering the courtroom waving at somebody she knew in the audience. She was laughing and giggling and writing notes to her mom and laughing with the attorney. 
she wouldn't face me. She never faced me, never looked at me. Her parents never said anything. I think what she did gave her sort of the uh, celebrity status in a twisted way that she'd never had. It gave her some kind of identity. Krista's friend Kim took the stand against her, and her testimony was an important part of the case for the prosecution. You needed that witness there because Kim said Krista came back from the murder and talked about it and celebrated it and danced around and was all happy about it. And that was important for the jury to hear, so I think what Kim did was a service. Controversially, the jury was shown Colleen's skull with its missing fragment. You cannot get emotional in the trials. You cannot say one word because you get thrown out of the court. There's no emotion at all you can send. But as they were passing her skull around to all the jurors and the pieces just falling everywhere, it was very hard. When Colleen's skull was brought out for the jury to look at, to show the piece where she had bashed her skull in, Krista sat at the table and cried during those moments. Hearing the horrifying details of her daughter's murder took its toll on Colleen's mother. I had quite a bit of nightmares. Um, you don't sleep. I have to take medication to sleep. It's all too real. Colleen's body, seeing it and identifying it and seeing her head off and seeing the body parts that I had to deal with was not easy. Yeah. On March 29, 1996, the jury found Krista Pike guilty of the murder of Colleen Slemmer. In, in my career, I've seen some bad things, a lot of horrific murders. But if you'd have told me that there was anybody like Krista Pike, I'd have never believed it. The next day, 18-year-old Krista Pike was sent to death row. It is therefore ordered that you shall be put to death by execution <laughs> in the mode prescribed by law, and that you shall be transferred to the custody of the warden. The jury took, I think, around 90 minutes to convict her on the death penalty. And that's unheard of to come back that quick, but I think that included an hour, hour for lunch. <laughs> so they, they saw no good in her either. And for the 12th day of January, 1997, your body shall be subjected to shock by a sufficient current of electricity. Oh, God, have mercy. Having just gotten a death sentence, how would most people react? I would, I'm at catatonic, right? Within a matter of hours, she's taking a piece of paper and pen and writing a letter to Daryl saying, hey, love, can you believe they did this to me? She writes that letter to Tadaryl, completely unrepentant. As a matter of fact, sort of chuckling about it, saying, huh, I tried to be nice to her, and look what they did to me. That sucks. I think she should have been put to death right there and then. If you're going to do that to somebody and carve a pentagram for 45 minutes and take everything like that, why not do it to them? Krista Pike was sent straight to prison, but even on death row, she was still a danger to others. Because she had such highly violent tendencies, she went on to attempt to murder a, another cellmate in her prison. She was going to death row. She really had nothing to lose, which was just another risk factor for her to engage in ongoing violence. After being found guilty of the murder of Colleen, Krista Pike was sent to the Deborah K. Johnson Rehabilitation Center in Nashville to await her execution. 
She's confined pretty much 23 hours a day. And she has said herself, she gets an hour outside for like exercise. She's a very unique prisoner in our state. She is the only woman who is facing execution in the state, the only woman. So there, there's no one else like her. When a fellow inmate, Patricia Jones, also in prison for murder, dared to cross her, Krista Pike's murderous tendencies didn't lay dormant for long. I'm gonna tell you, Patricia Jones is not a woman I would mess with, and here's why. She uh, has a violent past. She is a very aggressive, angry person at times. You do not want to toy with Patricia Jones. In the mid-90s, about 1994, she was convicted of murdering an old lady in her house. Uh, I think she stabbed her repeatedly. Krista Pike was not impressed when Jones took a dislike to her alleged lover, Natasha Cornett. I think Krista was in a relationship with Natasha Cornett, and uh, Patricia was, Patricia Jones was somebody who was a negative force in that relationship because Patricia didn't like Natasha, and so Krista would take up for Natasha, and that's where she and, and Patricia would clash. On August 24th, 2001, Pike saw an opportunity to get close to her rival and went in for the kill. What happened is there was a fire in the prison, one of several that had happened. And the prison officials made the decision to take these three violent women, Patricia Jones, Natasha Cornett, Krista Gale Pike, and put them all in the same space together bad move. Krista and her friend Natasha turn on Patricia. Cornette takes a swing at Jones and misses, and Krista has a shoelace of some kind. She gets behind Patricia and she wraps it around her neck. she is determined to choke her. They end up down on the floor, and this is Krista's opportunity to try and kill Patricia. And Patricia's eyes bug out. I think she's choking. Prison officers managed to stop the attack and pull the women apart. Essentially, she wasn't breathing. And when they got to her, they jump started her and got her breathing again. Krista talked freely, freely about the attack and the attempted murder and, and, and said basically, yeah, I was trying to do it. You should have heard her gurgling. What's interesting in people who are high on psychopathy or who are psychopaths, is they tend to be very manipulative. They tend to have a lot of superficial charm. They tend to be very glib. They tend to be very self-serving. On August 12, 2004, Krista Pike was put on trial and convicted of attempted first-degree murder, receiving another 25 years on top of her death sentence. She went on to serve her prison time with this idea that she was going to die regardless. And so she seems to have developed this idea that it doesn't really matter what I do. I have nothing to lose at this point. She was a sick puppy. And I wouldn't say crazy because she knew exactly what she was doing. She knew it. She knew what she was doing. Over the years, Krista Pike's behavior has shown no sign of improvement. I think Krista's always had this ability to manipulate people. I think she's a very smart person, so let's make that very clear. She wrote to a lot of men while she was in prison. She even managed to convince two men, one from another state and one correctional officer, to potentially help her escape from prison. 
he had a key, he took the key to the sales and had a copy made and brought it back and put it back on the key ring and had this extra one. And he was going to get her out and they were going to escape and live happily ever after on the run. To me, that just points more to the high level of psychopathy that she likely had. Because even though she's uh, engaged in this horrific crime, she still has not taken any accountability. And her thought process is still to think about her. How can I escape prison? How can I get people to do what I want them to do? Her attempted jailbreak was unsuccessful. They were caught and the correctional officer was immediately fired. But the warning signs had been there for all to see. This man had been visiting her frequently in prison and they knew who he was. It, it has to set off alarms if you have a, somebody who's coming frequently to prison to visit this notorious inmate. That has to be somebody you begin to pay close attention to simply because of the why factor. Why are you here? You're not related to her. You're not family. Why are you here? So eventually, I would imagine, and there may have been something that happened that where they tipped them off, they were, where they were like, wait a minute, we need to pay attention. For her, it's just, it's part of the celebrity. It's part of the attention that she gets. and. I'd be willing to bet in Krista Pike's mind, she thinks, well, this is my status. I deserve this. I deserve this attention, and it's part of who I am. And so men are going to be drawn to me because I'm an interesting person. Krista Pike's attorneys had tried at least three times, both in federal and state court, to get her off death row, but failed. What do you think when you think about the electric chair? Um, I don't really think about that because I don't think I'm ever going to see it. I still have a lot of hope, and I know that I don't deserve to be where I'm at. I've seen no remorse in Krista at any time, ever. I saw, I saw TV interviews and stuff with her, and she, she doesn't say I'm sorry about anything. I, she's happy. A date for Krista Pike's death by electrocution was supposed to have been set in 2020, but the COVID pandemic delayed the date. I will never forgive Krista Pike, never. I cannot wait to hold Colleen's picture up when she's executed to see her hurt like she did mine. If it was up to me, I would have did it to her what she did to Colleen because I think that she deserves that. When we look at people who are psychopaths or high on psychopathy, it's a combination of what we would say nature versus nurture. So Ms. Pike may have had a predisposition to engage in criminal acts, but the abusive and neglectful childhood certainly added to that and sped it up. All of that trauma combined with a probable predisposition to engage in violence was just a perfect storm for her to go on and commit this heinous crime where she took 45 minutes, if not more, to murder an innocent girl. I am Colleen's voice and I always will be. And once I'm gone and still hasn't been settled, Colleen's baby sister will be my voice. And it will continue until we get satisfaction through the state. Now, Krista, if it gets down to the nitty gritty and she's days away from uh, being put to death, if that ever happens, she might have a tendency to go out with a bang. I, I still think she thinks it's the greatest thing she's ever done in her life. It's something no mother or father ever has to go through. And I think what I lived this story with Colleen is been the worst nightmare of my life.